you're listening to Tales from Eluthane. The air of the Eluthane Valley was both warm and cold at the same time as summer waned. The daylight hours were still longer than the night, but today Hiereus and his people worked together to bring in their harvest before the hard autumn frosts. Hey! His friend Luso called as he came up behind Hiereus. Why are you wearing a tail sock? his friend asked. What? It was cold this morning, Hiereus said defensively as he thrust his sickle into the barley. Right, said Luso, sounding skeptical. It's always cold now, you think, but you're literally sweating while wearing winter clothing in the summer. Hmm, Hiereus grumbled at Luso's chiding. I like to stay warm, he responded as if asking a question. Uh huh. Hiereus's ears dropped and tail sank, but still he stopped to unclasp and remove his tail sock and tie it around his waist before returning to work. The cool air came as a relief, though he wouldn't admit it. Still, he grinned deeply as Luso walked beside him. Done with the squash already? Hiereus asked as he cut again at the grain. Oh yeah, Luso said, and Hiereus's tail swished as his friend spoke. We just finished hauling it into the temple. It's almost time to prepare the Thuometha meal. Hiereu sighed. By the flame, he breathed, as he looked at the extent of the barley field remaining to be harvested. Always the last to come in. We do eat a lot of it, Luso said with a chuckle, scratching behind his horns. Hiereu grinned. Still, now that you're here, at least I'll have someone nice to work with. Uh, most people are nice, Hiereu. Yeah, um, right, Hiereus's tail sank. He never had the will to tell Luso that he liked him. I mean, he said, itching his ear, it's nice to work with a friend. Luso looked at his feet. I'm not here to work the barley field. What? Hiereus wilted further as he realized his friend hadn't brought a sickle. Sorry, Luso said. I just came to see what you were doing. I drew for meal prep after we brought the squash in. Hiereus put on a smile as his heart sank. We each work for the liberation of all, he recited the mantra. Right! <laughs> Luso chuckled. As our labors are shared, by the flame we are blessed, he recited in turn. All right then, I'd best be going. Right, Hiereus said. Um, I'll be performing in the sacrifice tonight. Save me a seat for the meal, he asked. Sure thing, Luso smiled. I've got to go. See ya. Hiereus waved. May the light of the flame guard your path, he said as he watched Luso go. When work on the barley field finally wrapped up, Hiereus' arms and back were sore and thoroughly worked. He stretched as he made his way through the town green, past the temple and step kiln, and finally to his family's small home. Once inside, he stripped out of his work clothes and washed from a pail of tepid water. He shivered from the coolness, yet compared to working in the sun, even in Eluthane, he found it a relief. He found his priestly garb on a hook near the stove, and as he reached for them, his hand brushed the robes left by his sister. It had been just over a year since Moira left. They still received the occasional letter from her. The last one came from Edra's, where she searched the temples of the world's gods. The city was sometimes called the hub of the world, being the home of a goddess and a center of trade and learning. Hiereus trembled thinking about it. He would feel lost in such a city, and he worried about his sister out in the world. She had been gone so long, yet part of him still expected to see her when he went out, or for her to greet him when he went to the temple. He sat for a moment after he finished dressing, and surveyed his family's belongings and took in its emptiness. Then, standing, he rested his hand on his sister's vestments. May the light of the flame guide you home, he said before leaving. Outside, the smells of food wafted up from the green. The meal of the community sacrifice would start soon, and he had his role to play. This festival was probably his favorite of the year. It wasn't the most holy, that was longest night. But the communal meal, sharing in the culmination of his people's labor for the year... This was always part of the liturgical cycle he loved most. Ah, I see the flames finally led you here, said Mutha, the recently elected chief priest. By the flame, I'm sorry. The barley harvest, it ran late. Hiereus apologized breathlessly. 
Ah, pay her no mind, said Malu, Mutha's wife, as she waved him into the temple. You're here now, and it's not like we'd start without you, child. I'm a priest too, you know, he protested with a grin, already knowing their answer. We know, child, Mutha said, patting Hirus on the back. But we've been in the priesthood for over sixty-two cycles. To us, you'll always be, child, Malu finished. Hirus chuckled. I guess being called child is my fate. You and most of the priesthood, my dear, Mutha said. You should go meet your mother, Malu said. I think you're the last one here. Let her know it's time to start the ritual. Hirus nodded and headed off towards the central flame under the oculus. His mother had been the chief priest in the last cycle of seasons, and tonight's sacrifice would be her last act in that role as it was handed over to Mutha. His mother, Fosse, smiled and then pulled her son into a hug when he approached. Good, you're ready. How are you feeling? she asked. Um, fine, Hiroyus answered. Glad to hear it. She responded cheerfully in a way that let Hiroyus know his answer hadn't been satisfactory. Do you feel practiced enough? You were given an important role tonight. Yeah, Ma, I practiced. It'll be good. Good. I'm glad you feel confident. She pulled him into another hug. I know you get nervous leading a ritual. Ma, Hiroyus sounded abashed. I'll do fine. I know you will, sweetie. I just want you to know you will. Hiroyus felt his face flush and smiled. Thanks, Ma. I really think I'll be fine. Good, we should get going. The people are waiting and hungry, Fosse said to Hiroyus and the priesthood gathered in the temple. He followed his mother with the others out to the town green. It was dusk and braziers had been lit, speckling the assembly of his people in the flame's light as daylight waned. They stopped before a pyre, and Fosse opened a pouch of ash and began marking a circle around them, sanctifying the space for the ritual. When this was done, each of the priests came to her and washed their hands before the ritual began. It was now Hiroyus' turn to speak. Unfastening his lamp from his belt, he watched the crowd that had gathered. His people numbered little more than what the rest of the world called a small town, but even still, a few thousand people occupied the green in front of him. He trembled a little, removing the cap from the end of his horn lamp and adjusting its wick. These people all knew him, and he knew them. Still, it was an effort to keep breathing and his nerves even. Then he smiled as he saw Lusso in the front with a space saved beside him, and he felt ready. The light of the flame brings liberation. Its way is freedom through benevolence. Hiroyus recited as he lit the wick of his lamp. Its light turned crimson as the blessing was uttered, and he could feel its warmth reflected in his soul. The way of the flame is given. Fosse picked up the next line. And as we keep it, our labors are blessed. The momentum of the ritual carried Hiroyus now, and he turned to the pyre and stood and lit its kindling with the others. At first smoke billowed through the logs, but soon gave way to the flame's deep red light as the fire spread. For inasmuch as a person cannot meet all their needs alone, you shall share your labors, so that you may have all your needs met. For in sharing your work you shall be free from any one becoming your master." Hiroyus recited once the flame reached its full height. Mutha took the next line, bringing a cup, handing it to Hiroyus as she spoke. Let none perish from lack or inability. Hiroyus nodded in thanks as he accepted the cup. He could smell the sweet grain wine fermented in the mine below the temple. Next his mother brought a loaf of barley bread. Be generous with each other, and let each who can aid their fellow with vigor. She said as she offered her son the loaf, and he exchanged his lamp, not so much as part of the ritual, but to free his hands. He held aloft the cup and loaf, and uttered the blessing the meal was named for. Thuometha toponti ekpontos, or, in the common tongue, for ourselves we sacrifice, for all, from all. As we have kept the way, our labors have been blessed. We give thanks to the flame, we give thanks to the land. As he spoke, he poured some of the wine onto the embers of the fire. After sipping from the cup himself, he offered it to his mother, who drank, and in turn offered it to Mutha. 
Hirus then tore the loaf. May we all now share the blessings of our labor in the light of the flame. He then placed a part of the loaf in the fire and watched for a moment as the red flames began to consume it. Then, as with the cup, he ate first before giving the loaf to Fose, and she partook, then gave it to Mutha. The ritual not only marked the harvest, but also the past cycle of seasons and the formal passing of office between the two. Upon its completion, half the priesthood took baskets of bread and the other skins of wine to give to all assembled, and officially the harvest meal began. After helping distribute the loaves, he returned his basket to the temple, where his mother found him to return his lamp. You did really good tonight, she said, handing him his lamp. Thank you, he grinned, reflecting on the ritual. I mean it, she said. I was really proud of you as you performed the sacrifice, and she squeezed his hand. We're all proud of you, Mutha had come up behind him. We've seen you grow a lot since joining our number. I wanted to thank you for the role you played tonight, and not just because I took your mother's job. Keeping the Thuometha is important for our people. Thanks, he responded shyly, scratching the stump of his horn. It's always been my favorite, he added, before stooping to give the older woman a hug. Hiraeus, his mother said as he stood up, you didn't happen to see where your pa and Rai were sitting, did you? I didn't, he admitted. We should go find them so we can eat. You go. I was going to sit with Luso. Oh. She looked surprised, then smiled. I think I saw him up front. You have fun, then. Thanks, Ma. I'll see you back home, he waved as she went off into the crowd. He turned back to the new chief priest. Hey, thanks again, Mutha, he said. Your opinion means a lot to me. You're a fine young man, Hiraeus. I'm glad to have people like you in the priesthood, she said, patting his arm. Now go, find your friend. I'm sure he's waiting. I ought to go find Malu. Knowing her, she's probably already started eating. All right, I'm sure I'll see you later. Enjoy your dinner. Mutha waved and went off as Hiraeus went to meet Luso. His friend smiled as he approached. So, what's good? Hiraeus asked, sitting down. There's a spicy bread pudding I think you'll like. It's a bit too hot for me. But you like those chilies the traders brought back last cycle? Oh, I'm glad that crop worked out, even if they didn't turn red. I never know what to expect from new crops, Hiroyu said as he sat down and started serving himself. Yeah, new seeds usually fail this far north, but those took well enough. Mmm, Hiroyu savored the spicy bread pudding. You're right, I do like it. Mm -hmm. I think I'll stick with squash and potatoes myself, Lucio said flatly. Your loss, Hiraeus's tail waved vigorously as he took another bite. I thought you liked spicy food. Mm, not the chilies. Their heat does something weird to my tongue. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure what you're sorry about, Lucio said. I just don't eat them. Fine. I'll just be sure to eat your share of them then, Hiraeus grinned, thinking about it. Luso laughed. Whatever you say, bud. The air became cold as the stars began to appear, and Hiraeus shivered. For a moment, he wished he had his tail sock on. Then his mind drifted, and he wondered what it was like where Moira was. Hey, you all right? Luso shook his shoulder. Hmm? Hiraeus muttered, returning to the present moment. I was just saying I was going to join the foresting team this autumn, and you didn't seem to hear me. Sorry, I was just wondering how Moira was. Hiroyu smiled apologetically. Oh yeah, Luso frowned. Have you heard from her recently? Her last letter came with the returning caravan a few weeks ago, Hiroyu said. She was in Edra's when she wrote it. She was going to try and find her way toward Ikarod soon. Oh wow, Luso responded. She's gone a long way. Yeah, I don't think our trading caravans have seen as much of the world as she has. I'm not sure any Eleutheni has. Hiroyus paused, staring up into the night sky. Speaking of the caravans, did you like the cinnamon candy they brought back? Oh yeah, it was good. Spicy, but not like the chilies. I finished mine a bit ago. Well, I saved some. If you like, you can have one. Wow, 
Thanks, Hyorius, Lucio said, taking a candy and popping it into his mouth. I love these things. Hyorius chuckled. Good, I'm glad. You know, I could have traveled, Lucio said, or I thought I could. I wanted to join the caravans, but the world's big. I'm not sure I'm up for it. Me neither, Hiroyu said. Still, I find myself wondering about the places Moira has been. Yeah, it's weird having her gone. I think the whole town misses her. But to be honest, I had a mind to court her before she left. I never had the nerve to ask her, though. Hiroyu's heart sank as the meaning of Lucio's words set in, and his whole body drooped. Hey, something wrong? Of course, Lucio wasn't like him. So few people were. He didn't know why he imagined Lusa would feel the same way he did. He realized he was trembling and tried to still himself. Nothing, he answered, realizing his eyes were getting hot with tears. It's not nothing, Lusa said. I think about it all the time, that perhaps if I'd been a little braver, Moira would have stayed and you and I would have been brothers, <laughs> Lusa chuckled. Hiroyus forced the small semblance of a laugh in response. I'm sorry, he said. I, um, just realized it's time to start cleaning up inside the temple. I need to go. Oh, right, Lusso said, stunned by Hiroyus' sudden change in mood. Seems a little early, but I'll see you later then. He rushed into the temple, and as soon as he was out of sight, he started crying as he sank to the floor. His unease compounded as he heard someone approach from outside. Hmm. He heard the voice of an older woman behind him. You liked him a lot, didn't you? Mutha said, patting him on the back. What? Hiroyu said, wiping his eyes. Tears like that only come from death or heartache, and no one's died, Mutha answered. I don't think I realized before tonight that you were like Malu and I. Should have seen it, the way you moon over your friend. But I didn't give it any mind until you went off to sit with him tonight. Would that I had. I could have given you some advice. Advice? Hiroyus asked. Oh, Mutha said, sitting down next to him. Malu and I were lucky to find each other. It's not our way to make such things taboo as other places do, but there are so few like us that we seldom talk about it. Hiroyus frowned. The only man he suspected to be like him died alone. He knew his chances in no Uthane. You need to make yourself known, Mutha said. I suspect there are more of us than we think, but because no one speaks of it, we feel alone. I... Hiroyu started, but Mutha cut him off. I know it's an awkward thing to bring up, explaining that your romantic interests aren't typical. Trust me, I know. But by the flame, Eluthane won't hate you for it. And you'll never know if others feel the same way, unless you're visible. Hiroyu smiled. I'll try, he said, drying his eyes. At very least, mention it to your mother. The other day she was asking me if there were any young ladies you were interested in. Hiroyu sighed and looked up at the ceiling. I guess I can start with that. I'll understand if you need some time to cry and miss cleanup, but you might want to hide in one of the ritual rooms. The others will be coming back to the temple soon. Thanks, Mutha. Thanks, he said, and he hugged the new chief priest. Tales from Eluthane is a podcast by Eric Porter, created as an exploration of my D&D character's culture. The world beyond Eluthane is the primary creation of Benjamin Priest, RDM, 